I now have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker for this session, Mr. Peter Yu. Peter is the CEO of Yaru Corporate Group. Please make Peter feel welcome. Thank you, Ben. Mayo Liloal, Peter Yu, Yaru Manewamba, Nanga Ruigab, Kalamabo Jalani Gorajan. Mayu Burugun, Jungaraje, Nambogun. Nayoni Nanabin, Nambogun. I'm a Yaru man from Broome. Thank you for welcoming me here to your country today, uh, Richard. And uh, I'd like to pay my respects uh, to all of your uh, people and uh, for allowing uh, me to be present here uh, to be able to provide this address on your traditional country. Uh, and also, uh, thank you to, um, to Pat and her board uh, for providing the invitation to me to come here. Um, can I also acknowledge uh, Loacher, uh, someone who I've known um, for quite a number of years uh, in many capacities, um, and someone obviously well recognised and known as a great figure in Australian public life. It would be an understatement to say that she has been a trailblazer of, for Australian First Peoples because she has been that and many other more things for this country for certainly as long as I can remember. And her life story obviously is a testament to the strength of her will and the kind of character that she is. Her contribution to progressing the interests and concerns of our people over a long and distinguished career has been an enormous value to us and to our nation. But I just want to go back and uh, acknowledge Pat again and her board because uh, Pat, uh, who I've known for a long time as well, has been a, a lifelong leader uh, for our uh, rights um, and conditions and for social justice of our people here in this country as well. And, and she has been one of the principal leaders uh, emerging or leading up to and emerging uh, in respect to the uh, Uluru Step from the Heart and the advocacy for uh, the voice. Um, so um, she's taken on a lot of responsibility. That's not something unusual, but I think we uh, has to be due acknowledgement in terms of her endeavors and her contribution um, to a whole range of uh, many progressive uh, and essential parts of the uh, movement. So thank you very much, uh, Pat, for that. I'd like to also uh, recognise and acknowledge uh, June Oscar, um, AO, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner. Um, June and I go back a long way. Uh, we have a cultural and kin relationship and an enduring relationship grounded in our shared work in the Kimberley since she's right, Fitzroy is the centre of the universe. <laughs> That's certainly a place where I started my career in the very early days, so I, I couldn't disagree with that. Plus also having a Bunaba connection um, through my grandmother. Uh, with Bunaba country, my grandmother being one of the stolen generations at the turn of the last century. Um, so I know, I know, and it's fantastic to see and hear of all the representations globally from First Nations uh, peoples here today, and uh, that the whole idea is and and uh, and initiative through this conference is to look at uh, solutions from an indigenous um, set of eyes and I wish you well in doing that. But I think in doing so, in my delivery, I've tried to address three components of that, but I think I need to look at that by um, dealing with the, some of the things that Pat mentioned initially in her um, opening remarks. And one of those issues, uh, and, and, and give you hopefully a, a bit of um, insight in terms of the, my community and what we're doing to deal with some of these issues, uh, and also how we uh, see progressively what needs to happen beyond. But I think I want to start by addressing this issue that we see raising its ugly head on more than a frequent basis than we would like today. And of course that's racism and its detrimental and insidious effect on our, on our health and on our country. In considering the dismal state of Aboriginal health in this country and our failure to address it convincingly, we must be mindful always of the shadowy presence of racism. At the same time, we must not succumb 
or be lured to a false sense of security and comfortability in the incremental nature of relative change. I would uh, define racism in today's context and in the context of our discussions as being all pervasive in a systemic and systematic exclusion and structural discrimination. It is an agile phenomenon. It is characterized by how it turns, it shifts shapes, it emerges out of unexpected shadows. It has a capacity to coalesce and find solidarity in poisonous peoples and places, to manifest where fear and disenfranchisement coexist. And we see it again on the rise in Australia in new ways in response to different perceptions of threat. And I'm not just referring to a particular television station or newspaper or the owner of both. It cannot be quelled by a singular policy statement or institutional response or even by an election result. It has no universal, uni universal prophylactic, no vaccination or immunization or moment of extinction. It's like the influenza of social ills, constantly mutating and finding new hosts. The racism I'm talking about is not the like of the booing that Adam Goods copped, unfortunate as that was, though this is an em em emblematic matic of the story. It is, but it is deeply embedded in the Australian nation state, which violently imposed a Western world on 60,000 years of indigenous societies. The beneficiaries of that violence have never come close to compensating the first peoples of this country. Neither in the nation's response to Mabo, nor in any of the national milestones can we yet discern the dismantling of the systems of structural violence, nor the legacy of disposition and genocide. You only have to look at all of the significant recent historical milestones, and just to take a period of time, if you look at the 1967 referendum, when we were counted for the first time in the national census, if you look at the 1968 pastoral award wages and the creation of an internal refugee situation of expulsion of nearly 1,000, 2,000% across northern and other parts of Australia of a refugee environment where people were kicked off their traditional country and the gates locked. If you look at the Mabo decision in respect to the recognition of uh, a native title that there was a system of law um, in the common law of this country you look at all those opportunities, the Stolen Generation report, bringing them home, the apology, at every significant milestone that we seek to celebrate, there has been very little in terms of manifest benefit and outcome for the first peoples of this nation. And that is, of course, demonstrated by the continuing and appalling health profile by the continuing mass imprisonment, some of the highest incarceration rates of First Peoples anywhere in the world, the youth suicides and economic and social deprivation. So you've got to ask yourself the fundamental question is why haven't we as the first uh, OECD nation economically, uh, with enormous wealth and capacity to do so, but yet we continue to uh, disallow the advancement and the growth and equity of our peoples within society. Medical professionals and researchers do a great job at the front line with Aboriginal people, but I'd like to quote Pat again, which she once observed in referring to why Western medicine can only go so far. And she said, as Aboriginal people, we need to have a sense of agency in our lives, that we are not stray leaves blowing about in the wind. In a word, we need empowerment. Yet, yet discrimination is a potent enemy of empowerment. The power of agencies, pe of people's capacity to act and to make change cannot be ignored in any genuine conversation about our well-being. In a Western conceptualization of health, once an illness has been diagnosed, a whole schema of medical interventions can be enacted to encourage a cure. Be they the hospitals we go to, be the medicine that's available, and the surgery, and so on. We do receive uneven access to these services for a whole range of reasons. But to my mind, the observation zooms in on the tip and ignores the iceberg. 
the iceberg being the submerged issue here that a Western conceptualization of health denies or ignores or even denigrates the indigenous one and in doing so is incapable despite the very best intention of making much headway in terms of the well-being of our First Nation peoples. For us, a healthy life is fundamentally connected to our universal demands for self-determination, for freedom from discrimination, and for autonomous economic foundations. We know that our culture and our languages and systems and practices are protective to our physical and our mental health. It is not an add-on afterthought. Not as a policy of cultural safety pop riveted onto existing programs. Developing culturally relevant tools for the measurement of well-being is critical and crucial because it enables us to tell a story of our progress in a way, in a language that we own and according to our own values. These tools are important because they can articulate differences between Aboriginal people and everyone else but they can also capture differences amongst our own people and to what matters most for us. This important work has to be conceived by us, not driven, and sorry, driven by us and developed by us. And I'd like to just refer to an example of my own community, Yaru community, the journey that we've undertaken in Broome to develop such a tool and our attempts to apply it uh, and the and the efforts and our ongoing efforts to ensure that it manifests itself in a very real way in the way we deal with business uh, every day. The development of a Yaru-centric well-being measurement tool has occurred in partnership after much negotiation consideration with a PhD student from the ANU, Mandy Yap, uh, and my sister Eunice worked on that as well, brought the technical know-how and worked closely with our community to develop a suite of indicators and the prerequisites of a good, healthy life. What we would call in our language, but not necessarily just only applies to Yaru, but also uh, our other cultural brothers and sisters across the West Kimberley and East Kimberley, but it's more widely known in our area as Mabulian. In the quest for Mabulian, Yaru stressed the importance of family and community relationships and people's connection in country. To our natural resources and to traditional culture, along with other critical elements of life of more contemporary times, such as financial security, decent housings, uh, and safety. Prior to Western colonization, Mabulian was at the center of our cultural and social existence, informing our obligations to family, community, and country. The impact of colonization in our community has been traumatic, and the trauma has been intergenerational, as we all know. And we are now seeking to heal and work towards building Mabungurugu, meaning strong community, and Mabuburu, meaning strong country. We adhere to a widely held belief amongst ourselves that the power of culture and country in healing Aboriginal people should not be underestimated, and it's fundamentally core to our well being. Since our settlement, the Native Title Settlement in 2010, with the state government, we have, we have developed a range of programs aimed at achieving Mabulian, including our language revitalization programs and cultural strengthening. The best practice using, using our customary knowledge and skills in land and sea management, of celebrating our heritage and our culture, of working and growing individual and family capacity, of developing creative and innovative home ownership approaches and products and developing pathways for our community and the wider Aboriginal community to participate in the local economy. Next week is a milestone period for us, an uh, event for us when we launch the new Liangan Nerva Centre, a state-of-the-art wellbeing centre that will house many of the programs that we run for our zero to six uh, year for kids and also uh, our transition to work, working with young kids, reintroducing them back into the workplace, into the work system. Uh, at its core is the philosophy of integration, of integrating the act our activities of language revitalization, of our cultural immersion services, our NULU program, which is our cultural practice renewal, the Mangara program around cultural heritage, 
storytelling and archiving, and our senior and youth services. Along the way, with individual and family reconstruction and resilience building and wider socioeconomic development of families. The Lian Nga Nirua is a series of buildings and spaces for the conduct of cultural activities, but is also a monument to our commitment to the principles of Lian Nan. These principles are the foundations that we can build a secure future on, a sense of common identity and inclusiveness of connection with each other, with our country, and with the wider community with who we share, the town of Broome. But none of this is possible without us taking and owning our own risk. And then we ask ourselves, what is this and how do we do it? Our people are very familiar with downside risk. That is, we know through our le level of experience uh, of dealing with uh, governments, of dealing with government programs, of dealing with uh, initiatives that continue to fail us. So we're very suspicious and cynical at times about that. But what we, d what we haven't really addressed is the question of upside risk, about our level of engagement in the broader mainstream economy and how we position ourselves to be able to take clear ownership and advantage of understanding what that risk is if we're not participating, we don't have ownership or equity in that. It's a critical thing, so a clear a mantra that we have in, in our organisation is about owning that risk ourselves. And clearly, it's important to understand that this reality, to own that risk, has to be through the financial uh, independence. There can be no dramatic change and shift to our circumstances while we continue to expect and rely on public outlays and broken promises. No matter how well-intentioned, goodwill and yearning we all are for reconciliation. Cultural renaissance and the rebirth of our internal nationhood can only be achieved by economic independence. They are aligned and intrinsically connected and interwoven. If you look at what's happening at the moment, and I chair the Indigenous Reference Group to the Northern Ministerial Forum, so we provide advice to the federal government following the release of the uh, white paper on Northern development. And one of the critical things we underestimate is that uh, as a result of the 1976 Land Rights Acts here in the Northern Territory, um, the uh, 1992 Mabo decision, the subsequent Native Title Act, and uh, as a result of the uh, historical colonial legacies, um, ownership of large numbers of um, reserve lands that uh, historically governments did not want and shunted us to the side in the era of um, apartheid. These lands are lands that have enormous value as an asset in terms of our capacity to interface and engage in trading. What we don't have as yet is the level of competency and capability to activate those assets in a manner that we can drive the nature of um, our participation at the uh, table in respect to the future growth and development uh, of not only Northern Australia but other parts of Australia. So that this is a, a critical area of future growth. It goes hand in hand with the nature of the quest to improve our socio-cultural positions to deal with the current um, framework of closing the gap and dealing with those health and other issues. But fundamentally, those matters can't be achieved in isolation to the nature of our, uh, our desire and our growth for independence uh, through, through the ability to realising uh, the value and the growth of those assets, in my personal view. I do not believe that we can achieve this until such time. Uh, we do need to work in partnership, of course, with governments, but also importantly with major corporate figures out there to be able to mentor and coach the business so that we develop the competency and the capability because that there is still a considerable gap in that area. That's just uh, the nature of the, our experiences and history. But what we do need to do is to build the strength in the governance and the management that we have in our corporations, in our organisations. So that their capabilities, both at the board level but also at the executive management level, we are actually understanding the nature of the fact that we are not isolated from um, the rest of 
the domestic or global economic environment and the impact that it has uh, in our own um, places back in our own homes. I looked at that in terms of where we situated um, in Broome and where, if just as a, a quick example, um, we sit one and a half hours by uh, flight to Jakarta um, and 40 hours by freight ship. And that's 260 million people living on our doorstep. It is the fastest growing um, middle class wealth region uh, in the world. It'll become one of the, the fourth largest global economy region. Uh, if you look at whatever, you, whatever thoughts you have of about the, uh, China's uh, position in relation to One Belt, One Road, but if you go on the Google and you look at the map, you'll see that it actually turns around at Jakarta and uh, Singapore and goes back the other way. So, yet historically, traditionally, we've focused in on doing business with Perth or Canberra or Sydney or Melbourne, um, but our closest destination has 260 million people. We have, uh, we own a cattle station, runs about 15,000 head of cattle. There is an export uh, license. Um, we currently lease it to the Indigenous Land Corporation. Um, we have land, we have water. Um, we have resources, but they're underdeveloped, uh, and they need a fair amount of investment um, and mentoring on our part to be able to get to the level where we can start to in be involved in a trading situation. And that's the way that we see where our future lies. So I don't think we should underestimate that aspect of it because we do focus in on, and we have to focus in on the injustices. We have to focus in and hold the governments accountable in terms of their continuing incapacity uh, to be able to treat us as equals in this environment. But we can't wait for that to happen because that's that will be a very, very long time uh, and probably some of us, well, I know for sure, those of us here in the room and perhaps a future generation behind us will still be talking and arguing about these same things. But I want now to turn to the importance of language diversity given that it is the year of the Indigenous language and is so critical in respect to trying to find solutions in regards to health. And what the importance of language diversity in relation to our identity and our well-being. I, like many of you here and many of my generations, grew up in the mission era assimilationist time, where language in any fact or any form of cultural expression or identity was discouraged completely and if not directly punished. Like most of my generation, I was discouraged from learning my own language. And like most of my people, I'm relearning my language. Assimilation was the policy imperative of the day, underpinned by the arrogant notion of racial superiority. Just a little story on the side. Interestingly, we've just returned some of our um, ancestors' remains from Germany after about 150, 200 years. They were kidnapped and sold on the black market to universities. And it's, it's very interesting, if you don't mind just uh, bearing with me for a little while. But about four a couple of months ago, we returned 14 bodies. Uh, and they had direct evidence. Uh, the Germans did some forensic examination of the remains and indicated they were all traumatized and with blunt and, and, sh and uh, heavy instruments to the head. They were, and basically it's the first evidence of blackbirding that we were able to encounter of our people being kidnapped and being forced to dive for pearls in the 1800s. But what's interesting is the reasons that the, uh, the, the, the black market trade at that particular time was to sell to scientists and others for the study of eugenics. Um, so here we have, over a couple hundred years, the nature of the continuing racial arrogance and, and notions of superiority of trading our ancestors. And it's happened right across the entire country and I'm sure it happened right across indigenous peoples globally. It was very emotional bringing those people home. There was one person that was unidentified, the gender was, we were not able to tell, but he was so young. So the method was basically to tie enormous uh, heavy rocks around people's leg, uh, ankles and force them to dive uh, for pearl shell. And um, there was trauma around their, um, around their eardrums that indicated uh, for long periods being underwater and being forced to dive. But 
the nature of, of the mindset, I suppose, in terms of the treatment of people clearly um, indicates how, how not far, really, we've come in terms of the pervasive nature of um, racism as masculine continues today. But a, ma a critical part of that was the assimilation policy. And um, it was this arrogant notion of race superiority and the misplaced belief that the dominant culture could restructure our entire mindset. The means by which this was to be achieved was by shame, by physical and mental intimidation and by punishment. I certainly remember from my own experience of leaving Broome being sent away to mission school in Perth and the rude awakening that came with being sent to the big smoke after coming from a very secure cultural and social environment as a kid growing up in Broome. But also very much aware of the peripheral awareness, peripherally of the, the nature of the political matters that our parents had to deal with and were going through. But then when you go to Perth and you realise that you're part of this official program um, that this policy is driving, where they're trying to reconstruct your entire mindset. And that... Um, it was a, an official experiment where I probably could do better ballroom dancing than most white kids my age at 13 or 14. We had uh, the other, my other country women there who were doing the deportment class wearing books on their heads walking down aisles and things like that. Public speaking, we weren't allowed to associate with other Aboriginal people of our own kind. We were segregated. Um, we had private elocution lessons. We had um, the intensity of that um, in terms of the, um, the intimidation and how we had to react to that is, is still felt today. And uh, doubling on, to on top of that, of course, they were, they, were, they were not only Catholics, but they were German Catholics. <laughs> so um, it was a real rude awakening. So basically, they couldn't do anything about the colour of our skins, but what they were trying to do was something with our heads. So language is a critical part of that uh, attempt to assimilate us. But for all people, for all our people, language is the expression of our worldview and of our value system. It contains the, sig the signifiers of our cultural differences. It plays a crucial role for our people in expressing our social identity, in capturing our relationships with family, in speaking to our connections with place and with country. It is a vehicle by which cultural difference is communicated from parent to child. It is through the language that children acquire the ways of the worldview and their culture. This is why the speaking of mother tongues was not permitted in missions and schools during this assimilation era. Why children who were taken from families were punished severely for speaking in language. It represented the most powerful expression of cultural identity and a challenge of the colonial worldview. It can be difficult for English speakers or sing single language speakers to comprehend why other languages are so important particularly where you are describing systems of knowledge that is orally based. Losing these languages equates to destruction of the world's libraries. It is to human thought and creativity what destroying the Amazon is to biodiversity. Language is not only a way of describing the world, it is in fact a way of knowing and comprehending the world and of understanding oneself relating to others and reading the natural world. Cook benefited enormously from just such a set of knowledge systems on his first voyage of Pacific exploration when he made use of the services of the Polynesian navigator Tupai, who drew a chart of the islands within a 3,200 kilometre radius to the north and west of his home island, Oraitia. Polynesians are considered the supreme navigators of history. Their wayfinding techniques and knowledge were passed on by oral tradition from master to apprentice, offer, often in the form of a song. Polynesian navigators employed a whole range of techniques, including using the stars, the movement of ocean currents and wave patterns, the air and sea interference patterns caused by islands and atolls, the flight of birds, the winds and the weather. All of this information about a vast area of ocean and how to read its changing patterns was committed to memory. I've had such a similar experience growing up and working with the Badi Jawi people who live the north of Broome and who are similarly extraordinary mariners. They navigate the very treacherous tides and conditions around the Dampy Archipelago 
historically and traditionally on narrow rafts made from mangrove trees, timing their movements to precisely take advantage of the huge tidal movements to travel hundreds of kilometres to hunt, look after country, visit relatives and conduct ceremony. For us in this country, language is the connection between people, the bugaragara, the dreaming, the well-being in the country. When I was involved in setting up the Kimberley Language Resource Centre in the 1980s, my language, the Aru language, only had about 10 fluent language speakers left. When I became the CEO of our corporate group in 2009, and in response to calls from the community, I set up and invested in the Yaru Centre and we formed the Mabu Yaru, Mabu Yaru Nanga Centre. In 2017, we, be, we began the Walananga Nanga, Walananga Yaru Nanga Language Program. This is a two year study program for Yaru adults and teenagers, and we aim to have 20 fluent Yaru speakers by 2021. It increases the use of Yaru language amongst family and friends to kickstart the process of intergenerational language training. We focus on day-to-day -day terms, language you use in your home or speak to your children or in country. Faces relating to places and to cultural activities, tides, seasons, fish movements, the kind of things that my people talk about. We are aiming to create a community of adult speakers and have a group of men and women who can speak each other to each other in Yaru for an hour. And this has not happened in my lifetime. I'd like to read you a testimony from my Wabujano, my niece, Natalie Dean, a young Yaru woman who was one of the first graduates of the Walananga Yaru Nanga language program in 2018. And she said, I quote, I have made the best decision of my life joining this language course. It has changed my life completely, culturally, emotionally and spiritually. I now know my connection to country through language. I have found my identity and I've reconnected to my great grandfather through language. My children learned language before me at their school and it didn't seem right. So now I'm teaching my children and grandchildren to speak Yaro language. I am so proud to be able to keep my language alive. In 2019, the Yaro language is taught throughout the Broome Primary Schools in, it, with about uh, participation numbers of about 12 to 1,500. It is now appearing around town on buildings, organizations, helicopters even, street names, conser conservation and housing estate. It is an ongoing process, something that we are very much committed to. I'd like to conclude now by considering the issue of human connectivity in the 21st century and the wisdom that First Peoples have in valuing connection to one another and to place. We're all hardwired to be connected. Social isolation is one of our nation's greatest and growing social ills. First Peoples value social connection, so, social connection above all else. Being excluded from family was considered the greatest possible punishment in traditional times and reserved only for the greatest contraventions of traditional law. No physical punishment was deemed as severe as social exclusion, exclusion. For us, both prior to and after colonization, our very survival as individuals and as distinct cultures has demanded on our commitment to remaining connected to each other. Being narrowly self-interested runs contrary to how we are hardwired. Connectivity is part of identity of how we think about ourselves as forming part of the constellation of responsibilities to a wider network of kin and to country. It seems to me that this is something that we have globally and that we are very good at. Staying connected to each other, staying connected to the value systems that are under enormous pressure to change and staying connected to our country. This, if you like, is our holy, holy trinity. For us, the way of connecting to kin and to country was held out despite the colonization and the incredible pressure we have been under for generations to change that and to individualize and to assimilate. We have resisted, yet we too belong to the 21st century. Like people from all cultures across the globe, we are being trampled with the change, with flux. We are running just to stay still, just to keep up. We are entering an age of the fourth industrial revolution Technology, economics, politics, business, and the vast 
very social fabric that connects us are all being transformed and at a breathtaking rate. Artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, smart grids, robotics, the Internet of Things, where previously inanimate objects in our lives now communicate with each other according to our direction and suggested in our interests. As individuals, as families and entire societies, we are now more monitored more than ever in the history of the world. We are tracked, we are photographed, we are videoed. Our purchasing choices are documented. Our online profiles are mapped. And we are busy. Our phones and computers and often devices keep us on time, alert us to impending meetings and appointments and notify us of deadlines. We carry our letterbox, our camera, our diary and our desktop in our pockets. This is the connection of today as we know it. And yet research tells us that the more and more people are living alone and that the prevalence of mental illness amongst our population is on the rise. So clearly not all human connectivity is the same. Quantity does not equate to quality. It is true that these technologies have brought benefits to us, helping families stay connected across vast distances and allowing users to keep up to date with cultural protocol and practices. But there have been negative consequences also, and online bullying is repeatedly implicated in the appalling state of youth suicide in the Kimberley and elsewhere. It's a relatively recent technology and perhaps we are all still learning how to manage it and especially to manage its more negative consequence. I identify a couple of dangers with social media. The first is that people, for whatever reasons, seem to be more trusting and open in their expressions than they might otherwise be. Perhaps this is an attempt at genuine communication, but in this kind of domain where relationships are multiple yet brittle, this seems to me to be risky behaviour. The second danger I see, and I see this across a whole lot of social life in the modern world, is that people tend to interact with others who hold the same points of view. So people are not getting exposed to the same diversity of viewpoints that they would once have had to. I do think there is something fundamentally healthy of human beings about having to interact reasonably regularly with people different to themselves. In the absence of these kinds of interactions can lead to a lazy close-mindedness. This is so for us as individuals, it also applies to us as a nation. To remain connected, we need to be able to sit comfortably with curiosity, to stay open to difference. The danger with online communities is that they represent increasingly homogenous circles, which allow people to ignore their immediate possible diverse communities and connect only with people like them. This cannot end well. In spite of our negative media profiling, non-Aboriginal people want access to us and they want access to our culture. Because we are a very small, small minority in Australia, being accessible to us is a very real problem. When mainstream Australia does seek engage with us, the relationship can occur a very positive and very encouraging. They can be opportunity for growth. Human beings are meant to learn and they're meant to be active and in that learning there might be opportunities for healing. What might non-Aboriginal people learn in such an exchange? They might learn that difference is not a curse. Difference is not a threat. Difference is not a risk. They learn that difference is a portal. It's an opportunity to learn about yourself. You widen your understanding of the world and your place in it. The best value Learning requires risk and a willingness to expose yourself to something that you are not familiar with, which requires courage and trust and a kind of mental agility that it'll be right no matter if what I discover makes me uncomfortable. It's in this context that I want to reflect on the, on the words thinking being, speaking being, and what might be authentic enactments of each of these for First Peoples, and how that knowledge might be translated for the benefit of people more generally. Recent trends show that people increasingly value material goods over relationship, but neuroscience and evolution so that this goes against our nature as human beings. The importance of being authentically socially connected is an ancient wisdom that indigenous people have fought to uphold and stay true to. 
but it also seems to be a concept with a long tradition in Western thinking. Aristotle asserted in his treatise on social life entitled Politics, man is by nature a social animal. Anyone who either cannot lead the common life or is so self-efficient as not to need to and therefore does not partake of society is either a beast or a god. The First Nations people the globe over, the struggle has been to hang on four things, our identity as people, the territorial lands and waters of our people, our language and our culture. Any program or policy or research projects that seeks to improve a lot, that seeks to address our impoverishment but denies the centrality of these values will be doomed to failure. My final word then is an encouragement toward partnership which enables indigenous peoples to be the architects of our own future and to enact our collective responsibilities to people and to places for future generations. The extent with which these partnerships are genuine will determine the trajectory of First Nations people over, over the 21st century. I make this call, of course, to health services and research centres and to all those who work in the name of bettering the health and wellbeing of the First Peoples and Australia's First Peoples and the Global First Peoples. The call made in the Uluru Statement, Truth Treaty Voice, are translatable at scales below, the, below that of our nation. While we wait for the national agenda to progress, as I'm sure it will, it's worth reflecting on your institution, your research projects, your professional practice, and the extent to which principles embodied in the Uluru Statement are upheld in the work around, going on around you. I'll leave you with that Gordian knot to untie and the commendous conscience to you. Thank you very much.